All right. <laughs> we going? An intro? Let's go. Welcome, everybody, to the Real Estate Lab podcast, where we deep dive into the local market trends and topics shaping Austin real estate. I'm JJ Tolentino, joined with my esteemed co-hosts, Randy White and Ian Williams, each bringing our unique realtor perspective to provide with a look at the market. In today's episode, we're excited to explore a topic that's been on the minds of many homeowners and prospective buyers, the rising rates of insurance from property insurance to flood insurance and everything in between costs are bananas. We'll be joined by our special guest expert in the insurance industry, Britton Skinner with Goosehead. He's going to share his insights and tips and strategies to talk about this ever-changing landscape. Britton, what's your take on insurance these days, buddy? Absolutely. It's definitely a, a hot topic and interesting market. So kind of a lot to dive into, but um, we'll piece it together and answer any questions as we go. But anywhere in particular you'd like to start, any really hot topics or questions you have on your mind or um, you want me to well, let's, let's, let's bring this up. Maybe I should show the article. Yeah. Talk about some stats here. Let's start with that. Let's see. This one. Hold on. Sorry, ladies and gentlemen. What is my screen? I don't know about the share button here. Yeah, there we go. Here we go. Be good to because I feel like there's a lot of people out there that don't even realize there is a problem, honestly, with home insurance rates until they get the rate pulled and they're like, "What? Yeah, <laughs> What's yeah. that?" Very common. <laughs> that is certainly true, one hundred percent. All right. So this was released beginning of February of this year. Home insurance prices are soaring, especially in these five states. Mm. You can see that this <laughs> right here. Mm-hmm. Nationally, average home insurance costs were up twenty one percent at renewal from May 2022 to May 2023. And then it brings up the, where insurance prices are the rising the fastest, Texas is at 46%. Gosh. Yep. <laughs> I mean, at least we're not Florida, but come on. I was gonna say Florida, so. <laughs> they do talk about Florida a lot in here, but this is an Austin, Texas podcast, so. so. What the heck is happening in Texas? This is a lot of Florida hurricane stuff, though. But yeah, yeah. number five. And a lot of that, even if, if it's in Florida, California, Colorado, wherever it is, it still slightly affects rates nationally because a lot of these companies are obviously national companies. So as they lose a ton of money in other states, they still have to slightly make up for that um, to stay in business because ultimately – bottom line with an insurance company is premium brought in versus claims paid out. And that's how they're profitable or not. And that's how they stay in business. Um, But to dive into Texas specifically, um, there's quite a few factors. And Texas is probably the the one state in the country that has the most potential natural natural disasters, which is a big factor. So you can have hurricanes, you have freezing, tornadoes. The most, the state with the most natural disasters. Because it's so risk, big. risk for the most natural. So now we have the freezes pretty much every year. It seems like yeah. we have hurricanes on the coast. You have hailstorms all over Texas. Potential tornadoes or high wind scenarios. Um, so we pretty much have it all checked throughout the state of Texas. Them all. <laughs> uh, whereas, like for example, if you're in the Midwest, you might never. Obviously, you're not going to have a fear of hurricanes. Um, you might not see tornadoes depending on the state. You, you, they're more well equipped for freezes and you know winters. Um, so I at least got to argue that California is worse off. I know earthquakes are pretty serious. <laughs> well, but, but fires. Them, so I would say fires more than earthquakes, everything. but they're not yeah. even on the list, y'all. It's California. Yeah, how they manage that? You know why they're not on the list? Because they were already twice as much as everywhere yeah. else. Uh, <laughs> exactly. <they> <laughs> Yeah, it's it's almost impossible to write insurance in California at this point because everything is a fire risk. So, um, but yeah, that's just obviously one of the many factors. Um, but we were briefly touching on before we went live, you know, the different regions in Texas and what affects the premium, what impacts the premiums. Um, so, t- Central Texas and this Austin area, San Antonio, San Marcos, um, surrounding areas are considered or viewed, you know, a little more safe to insure than. Um, the Houston and like the DFW areas. So Houston's, you know, coastal risk. Um, there's more potential for hurricane, flooding, high winds coming off the water, et cetera. Um, so the Houston market, um, 
you know, with those factors and a few other things that we'll discuss has quite a bit higher premiums. And then also the DFW area is very difficult to insure because there are quite a, like, I guess the most or considered from the carriers, the most hail storms um, that come through that area in Texas. So deductibles is a big factor in like Dallas, Fort Worth area for the wind and hail or eligibility with certain carriers because they don't want to see that risk or, they, or it's not worth their investment or potential to take the business because they could lose too much money. So um, that's another factor that drives the premiums is the amount of available carriers in a specific area. Um, so go ahead, do you have a question? Ian? Yeah, we're, it sounds like I've heard mm -hmm. lately that a lot of providers, insurance providers have been dumping Texas. That is correct. And, and uh, this is why I'm assuming. Correct. So I'll backtrack a couple of years and it's certainly not the only reason, but a big factor in kind of where this started or some of the problems began um, was during, you know, the pandemic and some of the COVID stuff where, you know, that $5,000 used Honda Civic now is worth 10,000. People are out of jobs. The price of lumber doubled or more than that potentially. Um, so labor materials, used goods, pretty much everything increased in price with less availability uh, because production of new vehicles, homes were not being built as rapidly, people were out of work um, and insurance companies had not accounted for all those changes fast enough. And by the time they realized, oh shoot, you know, we're charging X amount premium where it needs to be Y now, they were already in the hole. So now for the last, they lost money for a couple of years and they've been trying to play catch up, which is that exact scenario. They have all these different impact ratings. They track everything. So they know what's the best business to bring in, what zip codes are, they have the biggest loss ratios in. If we bring in client X and Y with, you know, this insurance history, we'll take them, but we might not take client Z with a bad insurance history that they've changed carriers a lot. So they, they have all the statistics and they, really get down to the data of who is going to be profitable, what region, et cetera. And if they don't see it in their best interest, they will just either exclude or pull out of certain zip codes, counties, or Texas in general, as you mentioned. Is this public data? <laughs> uh, I'd be uh, really curious to see how that stuff is determined. A yeah. lot of it is. Um, some of it's obviously in, internal to the specific carriers and you know, maybe their formulas, their, their specific data that is private to them. Um, but like, for example, carriers have to file with the Texas Department of Insurance for their rate increases. So you can go online and see what companies have filed for what rate increases. Um, and if they can't get granted the certain amount that they want or percentage, um, then sometimes they'll either pull out or make a decision that, you know, they're going to not use certain zip codes. Um, and it, it all comes down to that bottom line of, total premium collected versus claims paid out. Um, and everyone is in, one of the most common questions or, or things I come across too is someone goes, well, I haven't had any accidents. I haven't filed any claims, but unfortunately that's not how insurance works. It's the quantity of numbers is how insurance is based. So even though you might not have, if the rest of the state, the state city, you know, people insured by the same company have had a lot of claims, it's gonna impact your rate. What are people going to do who have a financed home or, you know, that, so the lender's requiring it to be insured. And if and you guys say, we're not going to insure you, what do they, or what, what comes next for them? Do you, do you know the answer to that? Yes. So that's a hot topic, especially in like the Houston market, um, because depending as you get closer to the coast and south of Houston, certain regions, pretty much the entire market or standard market is out of play. Um, and if they are in play, they're going to exclude the roof. So no wind and hail coverage, which then you have to get what's called TWIA or like a standalone wind policy to cover your roof. Um, and then also Texas fair plan is now in play, which means if you cannot find coverage elsewhere, you can get coverage with a state backed insurance program. Um, and that is like the last case scenario because there truly are some houses that essentially are uninsurable in the standard market now. Is it expensive? Do you know if those premiums are pretty expensive like that's a an it's, option or does it feel it's like i mean they're on par with the rest of the standard market but in that area that typically means they're expensive because okay. no one else right. will take it um, but there is an option if it comes to that worst case scenario and then sometimes i mean like 
well, I won't go there, but do, it, do you know if the coverage, like if they actually go through an incident where they now need to have the um, the process go into effect, is it not that great of coverage? Is it is it really difficult to go through that Tech state program? Texas Fair Plan has set requirements, so they actually have fairly good coverage. Okay. Um, they don't allow you to go over a 2% deductible. Mm -hmm. um, and where like a lot of standard carriers, you can go all the way up to 5% or flat rates of like, I've seen some carriers that offer up to $50,000 with inhaled deductible. Just just so some people might not be homeowners yet and looking to buy a home, can you explain like what that means? Like when you have mm -hmm. a deductible for a $500,000 home, how much are they having to pay? Yeah, pocket? good question. Um, so a lot of people are more common with potential deductibles on their auto insurance. So I'll relate it to that because it's similar on the home insurance. So for example, if you got into an accident on your car insurance and you had a $500 or $1,000 deductible, you pay that amount. And then your insurance company typically will cover the rest of the damage depending on the accident, et cetera. So if your damage was 5,000, your deductible is 500, the insurance company will cover that 4,500. Mm -hmm. um, very similar on home insurance, except often, especially with the wind and hail deductible, um, it's based on a percentage of what the home is insured at. So if the home, for number's sake, is insured at $500,000, as you mentioned, if you have a 1% deductible, that's 5,000. If you have a 2%, 10,000, and so on. So 5% would be 25,000. Um, and the higher those deductibles go, typically the lower the premium goes. So they're inversely related, um, which is what people will try to do if their insurance is very expensive they'll gamble on potentially taking a higher deductible that they don't have to use to save money year over year. Um, but the, the bad part is if they do have to file that claim, now their deductible is very expensive and you might not even be able to really use your insurance because if you don't have that money laying around, now you can't file your claim. Mm. Um, so typically the wind and hail deductible is the big one, especially in Texas that determines the premium more so than the other deductible, which is called the all peril. Essentially, that's just means your standard deductible. So like if you were to have fire, theft, water, typically you pay the all peril deductible. Um, and then the wind and hail mainly is for the roof. And that's the one that impacts the premium more greatly typically. So as you increase that deductible, your premium will come down. Is this going to continue <laughs> to change? I mean, like, is it going to keep rising to a point? Do you uh, all look at that stuff? So, yes, we do. And that's part of the problem with why it's so expensive right now. Um, as I mentioned, the carriers are trying to kind of play catch up to get what they call get their book. So their book of clients to a healthy spot where they're, you know, back at least neutral or making money. So then they can start to bring the rates down. Then they can start to open up more business in counties they might not be taking right now, um, et cetera, um, which another very important part of that is making sure that all, hopefully all the agents are, you know, doing their due diligence and writing policies as they should, because if people are trying to cut corners to save money, that in return keeps the premiums high because when those policies pay out, then the carriers essentially realize, oh, this should have been probably more expensive or someone, you know, fibbed about an age of a roof or a type of house or et cetera, which in return will bring the premium down. Um, but that's what part of the issue as well. People are fighting such high premiums that sometimes they do questionable things or people can go directly to the carrier and, and lie about information to get a lower price. And that's why it's hard for the rates to get back down to hopefully, you know, an equilibrium point. Doesn't sound like they're going down. Sounds kind of messy. It's, not, it's certainly a tough market right now um, in a way that hopefully it helps eventually. Right now it's tough and there's a stranglehold it feels like, but many of the carriers have implemented, um, you know, certain restrictions or guidelines that, you know, a year ago were, were a lot looser, or maybe um, different, whereas like now there might be a minimum of 2% wind and hail, whereas last year they might have took a $1,000 wind and hail deductible. Um, so they've, they've increased their guideline requirements for their clients to hopefully help their book of business, you know, grow into a more healthy spot. That way, if, if that client files a claim, they're not paying out as much money or, um, so similar how I said, they track all that data. They've now used that data to implement, you know, set guidelines or minimums of requirements that they think will help grow that book to a healthier spot, which in return, they're hoping will bring the premiums down once they kind of get back to equilibrium. Hmm. 
So what do you recommend for people to keep their insurance costs low? What do you recommend that they do, if anything? That's, that's a good question. Um, a lot of it is out of their control. Um, and then some of it isn't their control. So like their insurance history is a part of it. So if you were insured, you know, with company X, Y, and Z for five years, that typically will be more favorable for a potential new carrier to take you on because they see you as a more reliable client. Whereas if you had a bunch of lapses on your record or missed payments, or you weren't insured, um, or you filed a ton of claims, that's, you know, typically going to increase your rate because there's a mass formula essentially behind every carrier where, you know, take your name, your date of birth, your prior insurance history, the property you're purchasing. So if it's built in the 1950s versus 2022, you're going to have a lot higher rate for the older home uh, because in the carrier's eyes, there's a lot more risk. Um, so a lot of it is based on the property itself, but then other factors that you can help or, you know, try to obviously make sure you don't have any lapses on the record. Your payment history is good with insurance companies. The less claims you have filed, the better off you're going to be for future rates. Probably, obviously there's certain scenarios you have to file a claim if something happens. Um, but on those little ones where it's like, you don't know, I always recommend getting whatever the potential claim is evaluated before you file it. Because even if you, this is a big one that a lot of people don't know. If you file a claim with the insurance company and it pays $0, that claim is now on your record and it right. still affects you, even though it was a $0 payout. Um, so for example, if you're- Per property or per like filer? Both. For So on home and auto, that's the same. And then your insurance history is saved on- online so we can order reports no matter what carrier you're with we pull your insurance history it shows us if you're currently insured you have a lapse etc your coverage limits and then all the claims so it's like how i pull a clue report on a property it'll show all the claims on that property and then also your your claims follow you so if you leave a property it's still going to know that you filed four claims on prior properties hmm. um so but certain back to those guidelines certain carriers have implemented they will only take clients with you know like travelers for example less than two claims in 60 months on a property and that otherwise they won't insure you now. Well, uh, what if it's the property? Is there like a, a judge? Uh, uh, like correct. So like if you were purchasing a new home and there was, I mean, I've had some new property. <laughs> if you were purchasing a new property and there was, Oh, you mean like if it's property you own, but like just stuff that's out of your control yeah. is happening. Yeah. Um, there are some certain cases, some carriers don't care. Some carriers, depending on the type of claim, will right. allow it. Cause like if you had a catastrophic claim where it's like you weren't negligent or anything, but a hailstorm took your roof out, they're not going to you know hold that one against you versus if you file a theft claim, every carrier is going to have red flags and ask you what happened. They might not want to take you. Right. Um, but the newer the home, the newer the roof, um, all those factors are a big factor in the premium and a lot easier to insure um, a newer property or a newer roof. Um, roof age is a big one in Texas. Um, obviously the, the location's a big factor in the premium, but there's only so much you can do if you want to live in a certain spot or that's where you are. Um, and then the other factors are from your history, essentially with insurance companies, payments, et cetera. But I didn't know the that they were keeping tabs on how many claims I filed. <laughs> I know, right? I didn't I, know that was going to be an issue. I thought it was I see why it's necessary. My yeah. yeah. I've ran sense. into a lot of issues with that example. I have one client that really sticks in my mind and she was like very torn up about it because no one ever shares that information, but she had like four or five claims filed on her record that all paid out $0 and no carrier, no carrier would give her coverage because they are nervous that she's just going to keep filing claims. So it's a risk in the insurance company's eyes. Um, and so she was essentially uninsurable. Why, and can you explain a little bit or elaborate why they would pay out $0? Like she's just like, um, my, my fence is kind of broken. So I try to do that and they come out and they decide it's not, it's not related or it's not mm -hmm. covered. And so they're going to, they're going to not pay any money, but that yep. claim is still being recorded. Is that what you're meaning by that when they pay out $0? Correct. Yep. There's multiple reasons why. Um, I mean, the big thing, which is really unfortunate and we got her taken care of. Luckily, um, we had a, a nice option because she was keeping her prior property so we could exclude all the claims and then the new property she was able to purchase without those hurting her um but a big thing is just education unfortunately a lot of people don't really 
speak to their insurance agent or, or they've gone and got a quote online or there mm-hmm. might be certain things they were never educated on that yeah. just like you said, you didn't know that the claims affect you in the yeah. future. Um, a lot of, a lot of it is just, unfortunately she never was told that and she was filing claims all at the same company and no one ever told her to stop. Um, so she thought she had a, a potential case and would file the claim because they told her, yeah, file the claim, we'll take a look at it. But as soon as she hits file claim or submit or whatever that button is, now that claim is Cali open <laughs> before before they even come out and look at it, which is why I always recommend have someone take a look at it. So they came out um, to you know check the roof, see if it was you know something they would justify or deem that, yes, this is eligible for a new roof because of the claim. And they said, no, this is not enough damage or it's not you know a viable cause to have okay. the claim. And so they would close it and it shows $0 payout, but that claim was open. And as soon as it's open, now it's on your record. So really so lean on your frustrated. vendors that you first, like the roofer, have mm-hmm. him come out first and, and see what his opinion is of like, do you think I could do this <laughs> or not? Uh, so maybe- yeah. As- assuming everyone has your best interest. Yes. But that one scares me because not well, maybe, everyone by any means. Roofer would say yes, but a lot like, of people. Okay. Uh, I've, I've mm-hmm. seen a lot of scenarios where roofers will leverage the fact that you're filing an insurance claim to push you to to potentially get a new roof, and it might yeah. not be in your best interest um, because that scenario. So either someone you trust or call your insurance company, and before you file the claim, a lot, a lot of companies have a, like a specific line where you can tell them what happened, explain the situation. Oh, okay. And then they'll, they can check your policy and see if one, that claim would be covered Two, do they think it's a, a claim you should file that will get paid out before okay. you actually press submit on that claim. Well, that's a really um, great tip so- to call the helpline first. Bef- the step one is the helpline, <laughs> not file the claim. That's a really, a really good tip for the video today. <laughs> and, and that yeah. is a big one on your future rates too, is the amount of claims you filed in the past. And depending on the claims, like the, the amount of payout, et cetera, that certainly impacts your future rates. So. I have uh, this real world scenario happening where there was a hailstorm not long ago and I had a lot of shingles that were in my yard from my roof. So I know that there were issues. Mm-hmm. I called out my insurance company. They did. They never went up on the roof. They just did the whole drone thing, mm-hmm. right? And took a, uh, took a look. And then this was, sorry, this was after my, I had my roofer come out and take a look. He was like, yeah, mm-hmm. you need you need something done. And whether I trust them or not, I do, but whether I trust them or not, that's irrelevant because the, the insurance company then came out and take, took a look. Even though I had shingles sitting in my yard, like I, they're sitting there, they came back and said, and, um, and there were little dings in my gutters and all that. Mm-hmm. They were like, yeah, we don't need to do anything. I was like, sweet. Okay. So now I have this claim. Now you got the tally. Zero payout. <laughs> I know that there's an issue. What do I do? Um, so you can try to get an independent third party adjuster if you think they're they're wrong uh, and yeah. kind of like fight yeah. the claim. <laughs> um, and independent that's, that's, third party adjuster. Never yeah. heard this before. I, um, I didn't no, even know that I, was a I would find I can find and follow up with you know an email or get you documentation if you want to share it after two. Um, I but I know there is I. I've not experienced it and I personally haven't had to do it. I've, I've heard about it and help people kind of direct them that way, but I know you can essentially fight a claim if you think your insurance company is wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you can have like a state backed surveyor contractor or inspector mm-hmm. come out and, and go that route. That's awesome. I don't actually care. That's what I, care <laughs> about. I care that it's fixed because it's, we well, want to make sure. Yeah. Right. And I care that I don't have 10 claims just to get them to come out and finally say, okay, we'll take care of it. Right. Now that I know that it's going to be an issue if I have more than one claim. Yeah. So what you would do is you would have the third party, not through your insurance company. That way you don't open a new one. And if you get the documentation and you have a valid case, you can go back to the same claim and say, this should be paid out X, Y, Z, et cetera. And I, like I said, I can find the steps. I don't know off the top of my mind, but I know um, essentially because if, everything is monitored by the state in the insurance world. And if people think they're not being treated fairly, then you have a case that they help you with. So, so I'm going to make an assumption that this third party, I have to pay out of pocket. Is that correct? I do not know the answer to that. Um, I, 
I want to say I think there's a state back program, which I'm not sure that you might have a small cost still because everything is regulated in the insurance world. So, I mean, it would be a potential, you know, case against the insurance company if they're not doing their due diligence and, and following but through I'm on their contract. I'm not trying to get so. anybody in trouble. I'm just saying I've got a garbage <laughs> can full of hey. singles and exposed wood yeah in a certain section i know it needs it's and ready it your roof happen. is ready and this should be correct happening. So that that's, sounds like that's an exactly inspector. why they have that's exactly why they it have sounds like you know, his drone wasn't able approach. to get high enough or at the right angle. <laughs> that's what it sounds like because he was yeah. i mean listen i fly i get it right you, you can't see every little corner mm -hmm. but uh, also well and there's there's the human nature and like there's discretion involved in it if if that guy woke up and had a horrible, if he tripped and fell walking out of his house, he could have been pissed. Or if he had the best news of his life, he'd be like, you know what? Let's help this guy and make sure his roof gets taken care of. So I remember what it was. I remember there's not always a cut and dry answer, unfortunately. He didn't have a ladder. Which That's is probably not a great sign for someone whose job is to be an insurance I mean, adjuster. Driving like a <laughs> <laughs> I mean, exactly, which is, it's thinking, exactly why they have those programs because you're, you signed a legal contract with a company that their whole job is to hopefully pay you out. So if, if they're not following through, then Wait, you got to save me help. money. Hopefully. <laughs> or at least get your roof replaced. <laughs> it just happened on the podcast. That's a lot of money. Very good. Okay. So uh, speaking of which, companies and if people have experiences like this, is this where they may want to switch companies or how do they interview for companies or are these reviews to consider? Should yeah. Ian tell us what company this is? We look out for that. Yeah. That that is up to him. I, I'm not going <laughs> to say he should or shouldn't because, um, I mean, in my my opinion, honestly, I think a lot of it is you know kind of who you work with. If you've established a relationship with an agent, a broker, a company, whatever the scenario, or if you're just using you know the general helpline, which that might be all you know, you're going to have a lot less support. You might not have someone advocating for you, um, et cetera. Whereas if you have built a relationship, you you know who you're working with, you know the company, you might be able to get someone to, to say, hey, you know, like I've had clients where they felt their claim wasn't even, even or either being handled right or, you know, incorrectly um, appraised or reviewed or, or something along these lines. And we've, my company has sent another adjuster out to look at it again because we said, you know, we, we feel this claim was not handled properly and we've had another adjuster go out. Um, so it depends on a, obviously a multitude of factors. Um, typically, if it's going to leave a bad taste in your mouth, a lot of people would obviously want to switch companies by default because they're scared that might happen, you know, in the future. Um, but I think with a lot of professions, businesses, anything, you might love a restaurant and get a bad server one day, but you might go back and get a great server the next. So if you have the right support or the people or um, the connection, you could have told two drastically different experiences with the same company. Um, because like I said, everyone's human and they might have a bad day and say no. And if they were having a good day, they could have said, yeah, this is a claim we'll honor. So, um, would you recommend somebody use a broker? Do you think that that's typically a good idea? I think broker? I was gonna say non-biased objective. Yes. <laughs> I, I truly think it is. Um, because all things considered, if your broker or the other is called a captive agent, so if you work directly for an agency and only that agency, like an Allstate, a State Farm, et cetera, they only have that product. So with the current scenario in Texas, if their rates went up 46%, all they can offer their clients is a 46% increase. Mm -hmm. Whereas a broker can rerun rates with all the carriers they work with and hopefully present you a better option and switch you um, to a carrier that can save you money, assuming you would want to. Okay. The reason why I love that question, Randy, and I'm glad you answered it that way, Britton, is because to me, that is the exact same conversation with someone who's looking to buy a home and might go to a new construction builder oh. versus mm -hmm. working with a realtor right. that can look at new construction, look at resale, look at different builders, Right. Um, single product family, which doesn't mean it's not a great product, but single product family versus a myriad options yeah and just to layer onto that or follow up a little bit um assuming all things considered with the information entered into getting a quote whether you work with a broker or a captive agent so if i quoted all state because i'm a broker and i have all state and an all state 
captive agent, which means they only work for all state quoted. If we enter the exact same information into that quote, we will have the exact same price. So a, a part of being a broker or working with a broker is hopefully that you don't have to call all state travelers, state farm right. nationwide, because technically they should ask you all this. You're going to have to give your name, your date of birth, your address. Do you have a dog, a pool, a trampoline? What deductibles do you want? And that yeah, gets tedious. Good. And if you keep calling, wait on hold, et cetera, um, you know, that's part of the reason hopefully a broker can help because we can show you all those different options as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and the thing is with the brokerage, we get a, we get a small percent of commission from the carrier. So we don't really have a loyalty to any carrier because there's it. The only way we make money is retention of our clients and, you know, quantity versus if you own your, your all state agency, you might make more money per sale. Um, so I truly am trying to shop the best rates to present my cheapest option and best option. So find the, whatever coverage and, and limits the client wants for my best price. And that's what I give you. Um, and then I, I always recommend you, you're welcome to go shop around and compare. Um, and the big thing is I always like to look at side by side because there's lots of things people will hide on a quote and they'll never speak to an agent. All they see is the bottom line of what's the dollar value, but they might not know they have a hidden 3% wind and hail deductible. It's going to cost them 15,000, whereas mine's 5,000. Um, so that's the other thing is you want to make sure you're comparing apples to apples because those can be drastic premium differences, but it could really hurt you. Um, out of pocket if you have to file that claim and you have no idea. So, hmm. curious if there's anything unique about the Austin market in regards to insurance. Is it cheaper because we're not Houston or Dallas or floods or hail? That that literally is the main factor. Is the location is why Central Texas premiums are significantly cheaper. Like probably half of what you would have to, if you picked up the same house and dropped it in Houston or Dallas, it would probably double your price at least. I I love hearing that. Can we do some real world math here? So $500,000 house. Yep. And I'm I'm just saying that because that's close to the median price point in a lot of these areas. Yep. Austin. Austin. Yeah, Austin. Austin region. I know, I know, I know. I gotta be careful with that. Austin, Round Rock, MSA. (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> okay. So five hundred thousand dollar house. What are we talking about for average or median insurance prices annually versus Houston or Dallas? Okay. So I know it's hard. And extremely it's it's extremely tricky to answer this question because construction home. Okay. We want it to be very exact. You could <laughs> you could have a drastically different rate than JJ or myself, depending on a lot of factors. But we'll I say all things be- considered, you have great credit, good insurance history, etc. Um, new build, especially even a, even a million dollar home with a new build, you could be still looking at a hundred dollars or less a month on insurance with a quality That's policy. Um, with depending on factors, but like a quality policy, good deductibles. Potent, like if you bundle in, you're, you're probably less than a hundred dollars a month on a new build, even a million dollar house. Yeah. Um, Cause the insurance company views that as everything's brand new. It's not very risky. Um, so you get very favorable rates. Now, if you go to new build in the Houston or DFW area, assuming it's eligible with carriers, you still will see good rates. Um, it's really when you come into the older homes, different roof ages is what drastically changes the prices. Hmm. Uh, so like if you were looking at a, a house built in 1980 with a 10 year old roof in Austin, it might be 200 a month, um, 220, 240, 180, depends on different factors. What's if the you, most you've seen? Uh, That's a good question. For like expensive houses and certain clientele, I've seen policies. $500,000 house. Oh, um, no, I want the I want the other answer though too. Well, both, both. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Both. Uh, I, both I mean, both. I've I've seen policies well over ten grand for expensive houses, um, okay. depending on the clientele. But also, like I've I've had an experience where I just feel horrible because it's a first time home buyer. She was buying a house south of Houston, close to the coast, and it it was less than five hundred thousand. I want to say it was like three fifty, like uh, like like a modest home, and we couldn't we couldn't find insurance for like less than like 5,500. What? Uh, and, and that was like the Texas fair plan. And that's, is that, that just homeowners? Like you're not even doing flood yet? Cause that's separate, right? So that's just. 
Yeah, so endurance. like region and, and certain factors just drastically change it. And like I felt so bad because that's the lend. And a big thing too, unfortunately, is the prices have changed so much over the last even six months, but 12 months and 18 months that lenders that used to estimate $150 a month or $200 a month for insurance, they're still sometimes giving clients those numbers and the clients are expecting that. And then a deal could fall through or they don't have enough, you know, their DTI ratios don't qualify because now insurance is at 400 a month or something. That's, oh my gosh. I, I owned a home in Houston in 2016 that um, had one flood in its history and the flood insurance premium for the year was 750. And then it flooded two times while I owned it. And I can't imagine what the flood insurance premium is now. And that's just for flood insurance. Cause you're not even talking about that. You're talking about homeowners right. insurance. Yeah. 5,500 for wind and hail. Like, I guess we're talking about wind and hail for what, what yeah. could possibly happen to that Houston house that requires that much of a premium. Right. When we're not even talking about flooding. Wait, when you all said over. specific person, yeah. wait, did you say she was on a coastal property? It was closer to the coast. Uh, it's what the carriers consider a coastal risk. Uh, so like five miles. <laughs> five I, miles it was still, miles. I mean, it was still a decent ways away from the coast, but it was within a threshold that they can, like most carriers wouldn't even touch it, no matter what you did wow. with deductibles and if anything. She smells the ocean air every morning <laughs> and gets to watch the sunset. I don't feel as bad, but yeah, if you're like ways away from the coast, right. and you're still being charged as if you're nearby, that's really unfortunate. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, the flood insurance, depending on if you're there, that's a whole different topic because flood insurance is completely separate, which also not, a lot of people don't know that. Um, but any water that comes in from outside of the home, even if a fire hydrant were to burst in your front lawn and that floods your house, your home insurance does not cover that. You need flood insurance. Mm -hmm. Flood that insurance is, is really completely separate. Know. I'm glad I do not have a fire hydrant near me. <laughs> I don't know if I'm glad I do not have a fire. I don't have one in my yard. <laughs> yeah, so the home insurance will only cover interior water damage. And that is if you, there's certain water coverages that don't come standard as well. The main one that comes standard with most companies um, essentially just covers your pipe burst. But there's like water backup and like hidden water damage that you have to add to policies um, if you want that coverage. But that most people assume that means flooding and that is not the case. You need a separate flood policy. If water comes in your house from the exterior anyway, that is not covered by your home insurance. So, so just to summarize for people in the back of the room, you're saying that if your yard grading isn't good or your neighbor puts in a pool and they didn't engineer it properly and then it rains and the rain ends up flooding your home, who's responsible? Flood Right. You you are responsible if you don't have flood insurance. <laughs> yeah, flood insurance. So it's a flood insurance. But then you go to the pool owner. Well, right? so if the pool were to like break or they did something negligent, that would probably fall back on the builder of the pool. They they have general the liability. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Depending on obviously you know how long it's been. The reason why I'm saying this is because I actually <clears throat> have this real world scenario. Listen, I don't make this stuff up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the neighbors behind us built a pool and I noticed that while it's not bad, we have a little more pooling in heavy rain. We didn't have any before. Did not. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, this is interesting. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Did they not do their job. Fortunately, the grading is good. So we don't have to worry. And we have a large enough lot. Where we don't have to worry about it. Uh, approaching our home, mm -hmm. um, our actual foundation. It's just the, I would see if that pool got permitted. Say it again. I would see if they got a permit. I mean, I you want to know? I, you know, pool builders don't always get permits. Oh, I absolutely. Oh, there's don't. a lot of people that don't get permits. There's, <laughs> yeah, there's a bunch of things that have been. Can, that I, can I share a website real quick? <laughs> Please. All right. Un unpermitted. Do I hit share screen? Construction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Share, and then it's the top one. All I'm right. excited for this. I'm actually a little worried, but I'm excited. <laughs> Sorry, while while you're you. looking that up, so I've got another question. Aluminum roofs. Yep. Get them or have, don't. Yeah, I have one too. Do you know your neighbor's address? <laughs> oh, I'm not doing that. <laughs> no, we're not going to do that. Right. Ian's going to get a stalker. So all you do is you go to, if you go to Traveler's Open House, you can search an address and it will show permits that were filed with the, the city. 
for an address. Oh. Address? Yep. It, and that's, I'm not saying this is 100% accurate, but sure, if, sure. if a permit was filed for any sort of, you know, remodel addition changes, et cetera, um, this is pretty accurate and can, it'll typically pull most of them. And I think they'll chart like, how every site like this does. If you want to see X, Y, and Z, you might have to, they'll ask you, oh, you have to pay for that data, but you can see a lot of the basic stuff. Travelers open house. I will say my property maintenance score is five stars. Just throwing that out there. <laughs> wow. Property wow. maintenance scores. What's the, what's the benefit of using a site like that versus just going to the city permit site too and pulling it from there? You, you could. I just find that There's one to be a, a little bit quicker easier and easier That's especially for yeah it is complicated going to the city so. for the purpose of like me quoting for a client too if it's an older home carriers will ask about updates often and a mm -hmm. lot of times clients don't know that info like hvac plumbing wiring um they want to know if if and when those have been updated and oftentimes if clients are purchasing a new house or even if they own the house they may not know that information if it's an older house so so yeah, actually aluminum wiring segues a little bit into a, I was going to ask about older homes having cast iron pipes and aluminum wiring. And so is there a situation where insurance will cover the projects that come up with those two things? Or is the owner always on the hook for that all cash? Because it's a really big negotiation point in contract. Yes. Um, that oftentimes is an eligibility question with insurance companies. So every company has a whole page of guidelines, which I can get mine opened up before I share my screen, just to show you different companies and some certain guidelines, but they talk about plumbing, wiring, roof types, roof ages, dog breeds, trampolines, pools, all these eligibility questions. And oftentimes with very old houses, if plumbing or like if there's cast iron or like knob and tube wiring, cert certain foundations, there's a lot of carriers that are now ineligible for that property, which is very scary because a lot of clients don't know that or they don't have an agent that talks to them about it, which is why I say it's, it's scary that a lot of people don't ha ever speak to an agent and they'll get a home insurance policy for a new closing and send something to the lender and they could have four ineligible things on there. Whereas if they have to go file a claim, that carrier holds the right to say, nope, this is ineligible because that's really when they're going to go through the policy and make sure everything's lined up at that point. Okay. Um, I need to make sure I understand what you just said. So they're going to, there's an old home, they're in contract mm -hmm. for it. They get an insurance policy, they close. And then after the close, the lender thumbs through the insurance policy and finds out that the insurance company knows that there's cast iron pipes and aluminum wiring in there and that that is um, not going to be covered in this policy. And the lender has an issue with that. And so is that what you're saying? So that wouldn't be on the lender. Um, typically, the lender will just make sure whatever requirements to pass their underwriting. So replacement costs, full coverage, et cetera, deductibles. You know, the value is either higher than the replacement cost or the loan amount. That is their checkbox. The insurance companies themselves have specific guidelines for eligibility. So there's a lot of companies that will not take a home with cast iron pipes. Um, but and you're going to find that out, though, in that due diligence period when you're shopping for insurance, right? Is that part of like the, you, the questionnaire that you get sent you by the insurance certainly company? certainly hope so. Okay. Um, just again for the people that have never gone through the home purchase process which is 50 percent of realtors and a lot of other people in the united states just have to 50 of realtors. <laughs> they're getting purged now by the way i'm just saying okay the re but this this is the kind of thing that even a first time home buyer your second your third time home buyer can catch these or people that are extra like overly analytical but the question uh, i guess what i wanted to call in the question was um, the due diligence period. So can JJ or, or, or Britton or Randy kind of go over what that means? Like during the due diligence period, what is the due diligence period? And I, I know we talk about this a lot on the channel, but I think it's just important to reiterate yeah. for this purpose. Absolutely. Um, before I do that, Randy, do you, do you own a home? Yeah, but I don't want to share secrets about it. Cause you're going to make me feel like Have you, have you ever had an insurance agent ask you, do you have a dog? 
Uh, you know, I don't know because my husband did the insurance side of things, so I wouldn't be the right person. Oh, to run really? the or, yeah. or I tra- gave, or I gave my or pass to him. I Wait. did everything else because I was our agent, and I said, "You find the insurance." When we when we did our uh, Airbnb, it was the same thing. I was like, "I'm not answering one question because I don't want discriminate. I don't want anything." <laughs> yeah. So those are those are the most basic liability and eligibility questions with every single insurance company. So if you talk to an insurance insurance agent or you get a quote or you get a policy and no one ever asks you those questions, you need to be concerned because I have a rescue pit bull and I'm ineligible with probably 80% of the standard market because the dog breed. I remember when I was checking so for an this... apartment oh, sorry, and I had a hedgehog and they told me it was an exotic animal and wouldn't yeah. give us the lease. Exactly. And like, that's one of the questions hedgehog. every company asks. So I literally most of the, ma- the the main insurance companies you can think of, I'm ineligible with because of the dog breed I have. Wow. Um, are you so you're? I want to talk more about what happens when the insurance providers, if they don't ask you those questions and you close on a home. So then, what happens afterwards if that problem is in your lap and you and you find out? Kind of so, can I can I ask a question that's related to the other one before we come back to this one? The hedgehog? Mm-hmm. Do you have a hedgehog? No, not the hedgehog. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still wondering how that exotic no. that is, but go ahead. So obviously, this is where investors would need to be extremely considerate or concerned with who they're allowing in the property and what types of animals because- To my landlords. Always. Correct. Uh, yeah, the landlords, sorry. Or, yeah. Property. Landlords leasing out their properties and because the tenants I coming always in. always have the question, I have people throwing service animal in my face. Mm-hmm. And it's not a service animal. It might be an emotional support animal. Correct. It might it's, be. That but even is, still, if it's a if it's a rescue pit bull and yes. it's a service animal, what are we or you to do? Yes. Um, the service animal one is tricky because if if it is a true service animal and you have a medical diagnosis of why you have this service animal, I think a lot of companies will have some sort of flexibility or way around that. The emotional support animal one I believe most companies, it's it's just cut and dry in their guidelines. Um, so it's yes or no. Even if it's an emotional support animal, it's an ineligible breed. Or some companies have um, where they will exclude your liability coverage. So they can give you coverage, but if anything happens where you're in a lawsuit, you have no protection from your home insurance policy. Um, so it's, Real quick, because I'm kind of going through something like this. Someone I know. The insurance is it breed? Bringing to Britain. The emotional thing is it breed or like is quantity? Does that is there an issue with play a factor too? Some carriers like four. Or four. I'm gonna pull something up that you guys would think. Is yeah, five emotional support animals. All right. It's really yeah. I mean, it's like cancer. So beanie babies, bro. It's like a cancer thing. All right. I'm gonna share my screen real quick. And it's a rental situation, so I was wondering uh, why they yes. couldn't. Do, uh, do I hit four. Tab, tab or how do I do this? Or is it showing my screen right now? Okay. You do share and you could choose from there. Yeah, when you go down know. to share screen, it should pull up with an option there we go. or a tab or a window. All right. Can you yeah. see this? See right here, home underwriting placement. So this is all the different companies that I write. And these are all their guidelines. So if you look at animals ineligible. There's your hedgehog. Is it? So exotic. This is yeah. exotic. Yeah. It is. So <laughs> dog breeds, dog breeds. By dog history. Breeds. Um, a lot of them will give you a specific list. Wild. Uh, snakes. Deer. So you'll have like specific Hoof animals. animals. And then you'll have, have (laughs) here's here's your dog breeds. So every company pretty much I'm blacklisted from because I have a pit bull. So they they literally have a a list of every breed they will not accept. Yeah. Investors Uh, with tenants for sure have to look at this stuff. And and then same thing here. The why I asked about a pool, you can have a pool, but certain carriers won't allow you to have a diving board or no slide, or you can have a trampoline, but you need to have a net or there's no trampolines allowed at all, or... Tell you what, 
This is the most exciting insurance carrier that I've ever. <laughs> you ever thought of, this is a big one? <laughs> We're getting into some cracks and crevices here. With old homes, foundations is a huge one. Pure yeah. and beam, pure and still ineligible for a ton of carriers. Uh, oh. But okay, so, so what if, wow. so if you have a roof ages and you and you're ineligible? Are you is you're wiping out your whole policy, so you can't use anything in the policy now? If you have a trampoline and that, that carrier says no trampolines. That is, is that? correct, which is why you need to talk to someone that asks all the questions they need okay. to ask. Because so that's what you were bringing up before of like, mm -hmm. if you have one of these things yep. and nobody knows, and then correct. something happens and they discover, oh, but you have this thing, but it's actually really unrelated to what we're even talking about. It doesn't correct. matter because the whole policy is ineligible. That's what you're correct. trying to say. So that is an eligibility question. So let's say your house burnt down and they came out to evaluate, but your trampoline's in perfect condition in the backyard and that carrier does not accept trampolines. They could cancel your policy and deny your claim to rebuild your house because the policy was ineligible due to the trampoline. So this is crazy. Like, how do you and assess? So it's important to tell clients when they're doing the due diligence period, which Ian asked us to elaborate on that. It's a period uh, when you're in contract on a home and you have your option period to inspect the house. Um, but you, and, but in that option period, you should also be shopping for your insurance and making sure you're comfortable with what you see there because there's lots of surprises that can come up like we're learning today. And you need to be able to terminate your contract and pull out and get your earnest money back. Um, for whatever reason you have found out that you don't want this house. So in that option period, you need to be talking to this insurance broker, finding your options and making sure that the insurance broker has asked all these questions, especially if you're in an old house, it sounds like. Correct. Yeah. The, the main thing there with eligibility is going to be an older home. Um, the baseline for every company pretty much is the pets, the trampolines and the pools. And most companies will accept trampolines or pools if there's a net around the trampoline or assuming pretty much every single yard in Texas is fully fenced in, but the, the pool has to be fully fenced in. Um, and then the diving board and slides are like hit or miss depending on the company. Some will take them, some won't because that's a liability concern for them. Um, but those are the big ones until you get into the really old homes. Um, but a lot of the times those details like the plumbing, that stuff's either been updated or it's something that, um, isn't going to be an eligibility issue unless you're looking at some very old homes. Um, so the oh, main ones. Cast iron pipes are rampant. <laughs> so yeah, like, so that's one that yeah. can make it ineligible, right? So that's, Correct. I mean, that's Correct. something that I come up with a lot. Okay. I'm, a, very I'm closing on a home in Temple that was built in 1901. Wow. Can that you, sucks. Uh, see <laughs> that's a wonderful. Yeah, so so oh, you'll want to know the updates on that one, hopefully. A lot of work. Um, I mean, I, I mean, I already know it's pier and beam, half of it, the part that wasn't built mm -hmm. later, right? Yeah. And then there's a, like a, like a container home in the back. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, it's fun. Did yeah. you ever answer the question about the, the uh, aluminum roof? We did not, but I want to make sure I also, I think it may have been Randy's question or followed off of it about, I, th I think JJ might have mentioned about like landlords. Those eligibility guidelines do apply to your tenants. So the worst case I've ever seen is, uh, a client bought a home and they closed, which also a very important thing to note. There are different types of insurance for your property. If you insurance is based on occupancy, not ownership. So if you own the property, but do not live there and tenants rent it, it is not a homeowner's policy. It is a dwelling policy, which is a DP3 or a DP1. A homeowner's policy would be an HO3. Homeowners means it is owner occupied or a secondary residence. If tenants live there, it is not covered properly with the homeowner's policy. I've seen policies cancel with big claims because it was a homeowner's policy when tenants were living there. Um, and then it, it follows into this one client had not my client, another agent that I work with, got a call. The client had closed on a property as a homeowner's policy, never lived there. Instantly we had tenants move in. So the wrong policy form also probably committed fraud by lying about how he's gonna use the property, but not my problem because I <laughs> I wasn't involved in this and I'm not gonna be the one to tell him what he can and can't do. Um, and then the tenant had a pit bull, which was ineligible with the company he had the homeowner's policy with, which didn't necessarily matter anyways. The pit bull bit a girl in the face, a little girl. Oh and, my gosh. And the 
the owner was getting sued because the tenant's dog bit someone in the face and the owner has zero coverage because he had the wrong form. That dog was ineligible and he's probably on the hook for a multi-million dollar lawsuit. Um, oh my gosh. So it's, it's very rare, but those eligibility questions are the ones that are, if you ever need it, those are the most important ones um, because insurance is there for that worst case scenario. Um, so that's, that's why it's very important to make sure things are done properly. Um, but <laughs> now that everyone's depressed about that, story, <laughs> yeah, I can yeah, answer, I can answer about checking that. the tenants <laughs> and dogs. Yeah. I mean, a more like a less serious one. I mean, obviously extremely serious, but not to that drastic of a scenario and like a, someone being injured, but a client had a homeowner's policy. They moved out of the property. So it was their home. They moved into a new one, never switched to policy, had tenants move in a pipe burst. It was $80,000 worth of damage in the home insurance. The company canceled because it was not a tenant. Or it wasn't a landlord policy. And so their tenants had to move out. They had to pay for all the repairs out of pocket. So they lost like six to eight months, probably worth of rental income and didn't get their $80,000 claim covered. Um, so those eligibility. And Isn't that common? Do people do maybe like not savvy investors have rentals and they don't switch over? Um, it happens. I think a lot of it goes back to the education. Um, I've even worked with, you know, real estate professionals and wrote their policies and they've had multiple properties that had home insurance policies, but people were renting them tenants and they, they didn't know they had to have a landlord policy. Um, cause there's not a huge benefit really. The, the premiums are pretty similar for the most part. Um, whether you have a landlord or a homeowner's policy because you're still insuring the structure at probably the same exact value or very similar value. It's just some minor differences in the coverages. So it's not like they're going to be saving a ton of money if they keep a homeowner's policy. I think it just comes down to the education if they knew or know they have to have yeah, yeah. a policy form. Wow. Uh, but back to the roofs. So what was the, the question was something about metal or tin roofs or aluminum roofs. I, I don't remember what the, the exact roof type was, but it was, it was yeah, aluminum. Yeah, if it was a tin or an aluminum roof, do, do you often get um, a better rate versus a composite shingle or clay shingle or clay roof? Not necessarily. Um, so clay and metal are looked at very differently than like an, an asphalt or an architectural shingle because typically those are going to be what is going to be a lot more durable and like a long-term roof, but also a lot more expensive to put on and replace. Um, so some carriers won't accept certain roof types, whether that be clay or metal or aluminum. Um, and then sometimes carriers will accept it with a, a, a number of years they'll you know, maybe they'll stop at 10 or 15 years for um, your, your standard shingle, but they'll go 20 or 25 years for a metal or a clay roof. Um, but for the insurance company, you're not necessarily going to get a better rate. It could, honestly, it could be more expensive because now they're assuming if they ever have to replace that roof, it's going to be 40, 50 grand instead of 20 or 15. Um, but it's not typically a drastic change or um, difference in the premium. It's more so just making sure it's insured properly and it's something the company will accept because often you come across those and they might be the original roof because it's so durable and the type of roof it is. It might be 25 years old and that might be a bigger issue than actually if the if the company wants to take it, it might just be out of their, their guidelines. So, um, and then there's small differences that I think are, interesting to know. Um, so like for a metal roof, travelers, for example, they cover um, if it's damaged. So I forget the exact verbiage, um, but it would be like not structural damage. If it was just a hailstorm that put dents in the roof, they cover mm -hmm. that on their policy. So it'd be cosmetic damage. That's the verbiage. Um, cosmetic damage is covered, whereas most carriers will not cover cosmetic damage to like metal or tile roof. They'll only cover it if it's, you know, no longer functional or if, if it's damaged to the point where it needs to be replaced, um, which is a big thing if you're going to have a very expensive metal roof and now you have a bunch of holes in it, you, you want your home to look good. So certain companies will honor that and other companies only cover it if it's structurally 
you know, damaged to the point of it needs to be repaired. Interesting. Okay. You're like a wizard. <laughs> <laughs> Which is why I think it's good that you people not not even me, uh, but like just talk to someone that you can ask questions, spitball with, and and get a a feel of how familiar they are with certain things because there's there's a lot of smaller details that are overlooked, um, and there's also a lot of people out there that unfortunately will write a policy how they shouldn't to try to make a quick buck, and you can really put a, a client in danger because the whole point of having insurance is for the worst case scenario. And if someone does something to jeopardize, you know, a client's best interest to make a quick dollar, that's very scary. Right on. And we're about running out of time. Yeah, and just, just to be clear, I'm looking, I'm talking out loud from a realtor perspective on pricing because the way I'm seeing coverage, it's, it looks like it may continue to go up or at least, obviously has gone up regarding monthlies this is going to take off the offer price right mm -hmm. so that's another factor to consider like within the year or so do you have any thoughts on insurance rates in the next year or so 2024 2025 it's hard to say i, I don't think the market's gonna necessarily get any better right away um, right that's but what all, all the guidelines that I kind of discussed earlier and kind of what I was showing you with those eligibility questions, uh, many carriers have made changes to their guidelines and what they will accept. And most of them have a, a higher threshold of like qualifications or um, like deductibles, for example, to mitigate their out-of-pocket costs to try to bring their book back to a healthier place. And the whole purpose of that is to hopefully make sure that insurance companies can maintain business or be profitable in the state of Texas, and then those rates will hopefully come down. Um, so I think we have a little bit of time left on the catch up period from, you know, all the stuff we kind of discussed earlier. Um, and then hopefully these guidelines that they put in place to try to, you know, build their profitability back up or get to a healthy spot on their book of business will allow, you know, more new business to come in at better rates. Interesting. Any other thoughts, comments, epiphanies? Just what I said before, this guy's a wizard. So <laughs> good to have him. That was a lot of info. That was a lot of detail. Uh, Very good. Appreciate you. People don't know about insurance, so hopefully it was insightful and didn't scare anyone too much, but definitely some important stuff no, to I keep hope in mind. it scares everybody. Uh, yeah, get a little paranoid out there, y'all, and that keeps you safer and, if, and better insured. Give like the recap of important factors and maybe five things to keep in mind for like premiums and, you know, what might potentially bring rates down. Um, age of home is a big one. Your new builds are going to be, you know, probably more favorable on the insurance side of things. Not to say other houses won't. The roof age is a big one. So even if you had an older home with a brand new roof, you're going to be looking at, you know, maybe similar rates to what you would see on a new build because the roof's a big factor. Um, we didn't talk much or we didn't talk about auto insurance, but bundling is, is truly a good option for saving money if it makes sense overall. And most carriers offer a pretty significant discount on both the home and auto for bundling. So if, if you're ever tight on home insurance, as far as like qualifying, or you're just obviously looking for savings, if you're already getting a quote for the home insurance, just see what the auto would be or what best options would be, because that could be, you know, 20% discount on the home and the auto. Well, we'll wrap it up like this. Call... Britain, <laughs> talk to your insurance agents. You can see it's a very complex stuff, so we appreciate you navigating through that. I always learn something on these great podcasts. And, you know, if you're out there watching, protecting your home and investment is paramount, right? So get the right coverage. We appreciate it. Thank you for tuning in. Check us out. Subscribe. We'll be on future episodes. Look us up on social media. And we appreciate y'all tuning in. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks again, Britain. Thank yes, sir. Thank you.